Every Sunday, in the parish of Manantenasoa, the celebration of the Mass is an extraordinary event. Each weekend, this huge gymnasium is used as a church, attended by five to 7,000 people gathered around Father Pedro. This Argentinian priest of Slovenian origin, who belongs to the Lazarist congregation of Saint Vincent de Paul, has been a missionary in Madagascar since 1970. Saved from the destitution of the street and the rubbish dump of Antananarivo, the capital of Madagascar, these people pray, sing and dance spontaneously for three hours. Not long ago, a 10-year-old boy came to confession. He seemed really young. In any case, I was surprised that such a young child had made his first communion. And he knelt down, he made the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, bless me, because I am a sinner. I was amazed to see a child of 10 years old acknowledging that he was a sinner. A child of 10. One comes across full-grown adults who are unaware of this. So I prayed to God, may this child continue to serve you throughout his life, and may you save him now and forever. I marvel when I see someone has been converted and has changed their way of life and has chosen a better life. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for strengthening us every Sunday. Thank you for your patience as you wait for us to return to your kingdom, to your light and your love. Sunday Mass is a real miracle. Here we have a place of exclusion, suffering and pain that has become a place where people gather together. For me, it's amazing to see how God can turn situations upside down. After 15 years, living in the middle of nowhere, in one of the most deprived villages on the island, I arrived in Antananarivo for a new mission in my Lazarus community of St. Vincent de Paul. And when I got here, on May the 20th, 1989, I found it hard not to shut my eyes at the sight of the utter destitution. I was struck with horror at what I witnessed on the rubbish dump. On that day when I saw a thousand children struggling for their survival alongside the animals, the dogs and the pigs that were living there, I was dumbstruck. It was like an electric shock. I said to myself that here I could not just talk, I had to act. Tins, used batteries, rags, pieces of metal, bits of coal, Nothing was lost, because everything could be recovered and perhaps sold in the streets of the capital. How could this be allowed to happen?
In 1985, the city council of Antananarivo chose this place for dumping both its waste and its poor people, all in one go. That night, I made a commitment to God before I went to sleep. I knelt down by my bed and said, My God, help me to do something for these little children. I don't know what nor how, but I did know something. I had to get these children out of this living hell. And that's what it was, hell. And well that night, I did feel a strength. And we began with nothing. We were unknown, with no money. All we have is our enthusiasm and the belief that God won't allow children to continue living in such inhuman conditions. So Father Pedro asked for the help of some young Malgasy people he knew, and together they ventured out to meet the inhabitants of the rubbish dump. At that time, the place was in need of some humanity. I am, of course, a priest, I believe in Jesus, but I came to this place as a man, a human being, a brother seeking to meet another brother, so that he could begin to feel that another human being cared for him, that another human being was stretching out his hand to him, saying, come on, we'll get you out of this. Of the 800 families that lived on the rubbish dump, there were up to seven children who had died per family. What can you say to a mother who has lost seven children? Nothing. You can take a hand and say, Mother, if you have another child, we'll help you to raise it so that it will live. Janine is one of those marginalised young people who was saved from this destitution. Her parents and their five children got caught up in a spiral of poverty in 1989. They welcomed Father Pedro on the rubbish dump. We were not at all like any of the other children. My parents lived in the street with my elder brother, and their life down there in the street was picking through rubbish and begging. As a result, there was no joy at all. Every day was a misery. When Father Pedro arrived, he was one of the first people who began to change things for my parents. He instinctively knew how to welcome people. Some people were afraid of him, but others dared to approach him straight away. Yet, because he knew how to speak gently with people living in hardship, including my parents, we learned to open up to him as well. That's how we became friends. My parents were among those who joined him in building the first houses and all the other things that were needed for the construction of a Kamasawa. In this way, since 1989, through unremitting work in fellowship and cooperation with the marginalized people of Antananarivo, Father Pedro could bring into being the Akamasoa Association, the Good Friends in Malgasy. This association is currently composed of 18 villages built entirely by the members with their own hands. With a population of 20,000 people, they're a genuine community in which everyone is respected and is learning to take responsibility for their own future. If God does miracles, they are happening here. We had been renting a place in Anasibe 
But then we were no longer able to pay the rent. And it was very distressing for me because I had to sleep in the marketplace with my children and they suffered a lot. Then someone came and asked me, would you like me to speak to Father Pedro about you? I could introduce you if you like. But I was scared. I wondered if this person wanted to sell me off to foreigners. But this person said, of course not. Don't think such thoughts. He's a priest. Since then, we have been living here. I thank God for that person who told me about this center. Now my children can eat, have clothing and go to school. As I am not educated, I have one goal that at least one of my children will be successful while I'm still alive. Rafa Rassou currently lives with her husband and her seven children in the village of Ambanyal in Akamasoa. She looks after the flowers and sees to the cleaning in the village. A generous spirit awakens a generous spirit in others because we all have a light inside us, the spark of life, of love, that never dies. This divine spark, the spark of love, must be fanned into flame because only love can bring people back to life. I gambled everything on this basic principle. When you love, others respond with love. We needed money, but it wasn't the money that brought about the miracle. It was faith, the faith of all those who work with me. I have 412 people working with me, almost all of whom are Malagasy. Clara is an orphan. She has lived with her mother's sister up till now. Thanks to Akamasoa, she has been able to complete her education and pass her baccalaureate. Today she works full-time for Akamasoa in the accounts department. I'm very happy with the help I've received and as a result, to be able to help others. In my opinion, the most important quality you need to work here is decency and truthfulness, rather than competence. Because I can tell you in my case, I'm not particularly skilled. You need honesty too. If someone asks me to do something, I do it. By making an effort, even if you don't really have the know-how, you get there in the end. It depends on your faith and the amount of effort you make. Here we are in the reception centre of Akamasoa. It's open day and night, and there is never a day that goes by when families don't come here to ask for help. The first victims of poverty are the children and the elderly. As this country doesn't have a comprehensive social welfare system, most people can't pay for even the most basic care. However, 10 euros a month is enough for one person to continue to look after themselves and live with dignity. Nini arrived in Akamasoa in 1994 with her husband and three children. Today, she is in charge of the reception in the centre along with her team. I was someone who was completely lost in life. 
We slept in one market after another. And then someone said to us, go to a Kamasoa, because there is a very generous priest there. You really must go. It's true that I was married, but my family had rejected me. So we came here and they looked after me. My children went to school and they gave me some work. We had been helped and now it's our turn to help others. And I share the joy that I've received with these friends who are coming for the first time who really need it. At the moment, there are 214 people here. Some are mentally ill. There are some who are in the same situation that we were in, sleeping rough. And the state of Madagascar sends them here. This is what upsets us, because the state is not accepting its responsibilities. Here we have two quite young mothers, aged about 30 or 31. The husband of one of them has died, and the other's husband has disappeared. If we don't help them now, they could die, or they will be completely lost. So when we have people like this who come here, we have never said, come back tomorrow or the day after. We've always taken them in. And if there are one or two cases, or ten or twenty cases, we have to find room. If God exists, there must be room for his children, for these mothers. So, as God does indeed exist, there is a place for them. First of all, we have to give them something to eat. Then they need a bed so they can sleep. Some are warm and, very slowly, we'll see what we can do for them. Either they'll stay with us or they'll want to go back to their family, we'll see. From this moment on, we aren't in a hurry, because they need time to get themselves together. It takes a long time to realize that a more stable existence is possible. They have to adapt to a different kind of environment, rules that might at first seem unbearable. This is what the families here experience when they come temporarily to this village of simple houses. They learn here how to live in community. There's a whole way of life to adjust to before they go on to a more permanent type of lodging. There are about a hundred of us here who accompany them, who are all concerned for these brothers and sisters. They all try to give them a kind word, a word of encouragement to raise their spirits, to bring some joy and to say to them, it's possible, we can overcome poverty. But we have to repeat this not ten times, nor a hundred times, but a thousand times. Sometimes it's at the thousandth time that they say, of course, he's right, my brother, I'm going to keep up the struggle. And here, our secret is not to throw up our hands, but to go on, to go on at all costs, to go on. This is the strength of the Gospel. Where can we find this strength if not in the Gospel? And these people here will finally believe you, because they say to themselves that despite all the difficulties, he's staying here with us. And my colleagues too. My colleagues who have given their lives and have not married in order to serve their brothers and sisters. This is important here. They've renounced having children themselves, so they can look after other people's children. Because sometimes you have to give everything in order to stay with these children and these poor families. You cannot only give half of yourself.
those who want to stay in a kamasoa and live in a permanent house have to work, put their children into school, and feed their children, as well as observing the dina, the charter that defines the association's rules. Today, there are 3,000 people living here who receive salaries for doing the jobs that they have created themselves. Miss Yubi is in charge of the workers in the quarry at Bemaswanja. In 2005, at the age of only 14, she left her family to come and live here. With the help of a Kamasoa, she passed her baccalaureate and studied office automation. My job here is not easy because it's very difficult to manage so many people. You really have to be tough and committed to do it. They are organized into groups and each group has its leader. The men who are miners break up the big stones. They are paid according to how much they produce. The women transport the stones and they make them into gravel which is sold. We find ourselves here in a place where life is a struggle, where life is a daily battle. We have removed thousands of cubic meters of granite from this mountain. And the women have carried these thousands of tons on their heads. This is why, for me, these women are true ladies. And what do these women earn? Barely one euro per day. We've never wanted to install machines here, because what would these people do then? They would have no more work. When a man works, he becomes part of society. He's proud. He has honor and he can stand erect to face everybody because he has recovered his dignity. And with the fruits of this work here, these paving stones and these quarry stones, we have paved all our villages. They've done this themselves. It's their work because part of their effort has gone into their own villages and another part into providing a living for their families. We will conquer poverty by work. Every four days, in the heart of Akamasoa, a house appears. Thanks to these workers and the income that they bring us and to our many external donors, it's possible to cover the costs of most of the public services of Akamasoa, especially the medical insurance. 10,000 children go to school in the schools built by Akamasoa. The challenge is to feed them five days a week. The results are among the best in the region. 82% of the Akamasoa pupils succeed with their baccalaureate and most go on to university to continue their studies. My spirituality was born from this daily contact, this interaction with the poor. It's the poor who've transformed me by approaching me, sometimes by attacking me. But afterwards I think, he's poor, he has the right to attack me. God alone knows how much we've been suffering every day. God alone knows.
For me, to be able to put out with so much despair every day, it's not by magic. It's hard. From a human point of view, it's hard. Sometimes I think, my head's going to burst. But my head doesn't burst. And why not? I don't know, it's because I'm a bit like a bush drenched through with the example of a man called Jesus. I'm soaked through with the gospel, with the word of this man, Jesus. When I decided to become a priest, I said to myself, I'm going to imitate someone, Jesus. I also received something of this from my mother and father. They were believers. They left everything behind in Slovenia at the time of the communist persecution. They lost everything. They left everything behind, but they kept their faith. And they arrived in Argentina with empty hands, without knowing anyone. And there they started a family of eight children. And what an example I got from my father. How hard this honest man worked, how many times people stole his work from him, did not pay his wages. And my mother too, how she worked. The love that she showed towards us children and the love for the poor that knocked on our door. My mother always said to me, son, when someone poor knocks on the door, we should always share something with them. And it was prayer that united us at home. And afterwards it was me who began to search. Who was Jesus for me? What's the face of God like? And I found the face of God in the poorest people too. And today, for me, wherever there's poverty, God is there. I found that if today we want to approach God by the shortest way, we should go towards the poor. Then we will find God straight away. Saint Vincent de Paul said, if you're praying and someone poor knocks on the door, leave God for God. Because God loves us when we serve the poor. And we should go towards the poorest, because they will not come to us, because they daren't, or because they cannot come. Everyone deserves a visit from God. Because it's God himself who says that, and it's Jesus himself who said, I came to seek those who were lost. It's only by serving that we can be saved, and by which the gates of heaven will be opened up to us one day. And let's not forget what Jesus told us in Matthew 25, 31, and thereafter. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. We cannot get away from that. Father Henri Rakoto Arizoa lives in Madagascar today in Ansirabe. He is a Madagascan priest and head of the Shamanov community in that country. For this month, by joining in with his words, we can pray for justice and peace in Madagascar. For me, Akamasu is a word of hope. It's possible to push back poverty and even to overcome poverty. It is possible. possible. 
And I personally believe that God has sent Father Pedro as a prophet for our times today to tell us something. Firstly, how God is confronting us so we can open our eyes to see the reality of poverty, the reality of this destitution. It's a question that's been put to us. Can you see the poor who are around you? Can you see the destitution surrounding you? Secondly, it's an invitation not to get accustomed to seeing poverty, but to allow ourselves to be called ceaselessly by all the situations of hardship that surround us. Thirdly, we should not simply just look or simply allow ourselves to be touched, but we must also act. So it's an invitation to do something, wherever we are, at our own level, to do something. The Word of God for this month is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31 and onwards. Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me.